I forgot to turn my mic on. So here we go again. Uh, Genesis yeah, chapter 43 is the topic for today. Gonna get double study in. Maybe it'll be better the second time around. But anyway, Genesis chapter 43, we we're trying to cover one chapter of the Bible every day. And today's Genesis 43. So if you want the free PDF that contains all of this information that you're about to see up on the screen right now, you can download it for free on our website. Thanks to the patrons and the people who support this channel. When did the events of Genesis chapter 43 take place? Well, we know that Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold as a slave into Egypt. That would have been approximately 1728 BC. He was 30 years old when he became the second most powerful man in Egypt. That would have been 1715 BC. We know that this was at least seven years after he rose to power in Egypt because Pharaoh had had a dream back in chapter 41 about seven years of abundance. Those seven years had passed, and now they had moved into the second part of what Pharaoh's dream predicted, seven years of famine. Our primary character in this chapter is Joseph. Once again, he's the governor of Egypt. He's a very, very powerful man. He was the son of Jacob and Rachel. We've then got Jacob, or Joseph's 12 brothers. Oh, man, I'm, Joseph's 10 brothers. <laughs> they were the ones who had sold Joseph into slavery 20-plus uh, years before this, and they had come to Egypt and met Joseph, although they weren't aware of it, back in chapter 42. Now they've got to come back to Egypt to buy more food in chapter 43. We also are going to talk about Benjamin. This was Joseph's 11th and youngest brother. He was the only other brother of Jacob and Rachel. Uh, there was Joseph and Benjamin. They were both sons of Rachel. And then finally, Jacob. He was the son of Isaac. He was the father of these 12 boys that we've been talking about for quite a while now. And um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say on him. Where do these events take place? Well, grab your map and get ready to reference. Jacob lived in Canaan, up there by the Dead Sea. Uh, we've been talking about that area for quite a while now. Now, he had to send his, his 10 boys, or in this chapter, his 11 boys, down to Egypt, which was southwest of him, to buy food. I think I've broken this chapter down into two big sections. The first one is verses 1 through 14. Jacob relents and allows Benjamin to go to Egypt. So you remember where we left off in the last chapter. The brothers had returned from Egypt. They had had a terrible experience there. They had been in custody for three days. Joseph, down in Egypt, is holding Simeon in prison until they returned with Benjamin, their brother. But Jacob, remember his response at the end of the last chapter, he said, no, I'm not allowing you to take Benjamin because I don't want anything to happen to him. Well, the famine was pretty bad in Canaan, and when you don't have anything to eat, sometimes that can change your mind. And Jacob and his, his sons were running out of food. So Jacob told his sons, go back down to Egypt, buy more food. His sons told him, no, we cannot do that. We cannot go unless Benjamin goes with us, because the governor, who was Joseph, had told them that they would not see his face, they would not get any more food until Benjamin came down with them. Benjamin was the proof that they weren't spies. Judah told his father that he would be responsible for Benjamin, and if anything happened to Benjamin, he would bear the guilt. So Jacob finally agreed to let Benjamin go, and he told his sons to take this governor of Egypt uh, a present, and the present consisted of fruit and balm and honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Now that would have been a pretty extravagant gift during a time of a famine. He also told them to take double the money so that they could pay for the money that they had found in their sacks at the end of the last chapter. That way they would also show that they were honest men. So then section number two, verses 15 through 34, Joseph's brothers are invited into his home. So the brothers traveled down to Egypt. They appeared before Joseph. And when Joseph saw that Benjamin was with them, he had his steward invite them into his home. Now, they took this as a bad thing. They were afraid that Joseph was going to take them and to make them servants or basically slaves in Egypt. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and they, they started to explain to him what happened on the last trip. They had found their money in their bags. They didn't know how it got there, but they had brought the money back so they could pay double this time around. The steward of Joseph's house told them not to worry, though. It was not a problem. 
He knew about the money, and it was not a concern. He brought them into Joseph's house, washed their feet, gave them water to drink, and he cared for their donkey. So they were welcomed with hospitality, and they waited till about noon when Joseph came into the house to eat. Apparently, it was his lunch break. They gave him the present that they had brought down from Jacob, and he inquired about their father's, or his father's, health. And they told him that Jacob was doing fine in Canaan. He was still healthy. He was still alive. Joseph greeted Benjamin, who he hadn't seen in you know, so long, and he, he became emotional after that. And so he quickly had to leave the room so that no one saw him become emotional because he wasn't ready to reveal who he was yet. After he collected himself, he returned and food was served. Joseph ate by himself and then the Egyptians ate by themselves because the text tells us the Egyptians thought it was an abomination to eat with the Hebrews. So then the Hebrews ate by themselves and they were seated in order of their their age, from the oldest to the youngest. And this really shocked them, <laughs> because how you know how could this be? It certainly with eleven brothers, it couldn't be a coincidence. And they had no idea that Joseph knew how old they were. So they were then served food from Joseph's table, but Benjamin received five times as much as the other brothers. We conclude chapter forty-three with Joseph's brothers in his house, but they still don't know who he is. So now let's talk about an application, and this application will become clearer and clearer as we read the next couple chapters. People change over time, and I think we should be anxious to observe new maturity in people and to welcome them as their new mature self. It's easy to write a person off once you've had a bad experience with them, but over time people grow, they mature, and they become more like Jesus. In one individual who we see this in a little bit in this chapter, but we're definitely going to see it in the next chapter, is Judah. If you remember back in Genesis 37, it was actually Judah who proposed that the brothers sell Joseph to the Ishmaelite uh, caravan as they passed by. So it was Judah who said, hey, let's sell him as a slave. Let's not kill him. Let's at least get a little bit of money out of our brother so he's worth something to us in, in doing this. Yeah, you know, then we don't have to hide the body, so we'll sell them to these Ishmaelites, right? It was Judah who proposed that. But in this chapter, what do we see? We see a 20-year-older Judah stepping up and going to his father and saying, I will take responsibility for Benjamin's safety. And if something happens to him, I will bear the guilt. Now, those are just words, but what we're going to see in the next chapter is Judah volunteering to become a slave for the rest of his life so that Benjamin can return to his father in Canaan. So this wasn't just words. This was something that he was actually willing to follow through with. In chapter 37, he sold his brother and broke his father's heart. In the next chapter, we're going to see him willing to sacrifice his own life to save his brother's life and to preserve his father's heart. So needless to say, Judah was a very different man. So when we think about our relationships with other people, let's hope and pray that people grow out of being their old sinful selves that they were in the past, and they grow up to a better version of themselves. And when that better version arrives, let's welcome it rather than holding their past against them forever. If Jesus believes in us that we can change, then we should believe that other people can change. Okay, so Genesis 43, Joseph's brothers return. Oh, wow. Well, uh, anyway, return with Benjamin. Now the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. But Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy, your, buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, Why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you still had another brother? But they said, The man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, Is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words, Could we possibly have known that he would say, Bring your brother down? Then Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we, me, uh, blah, 
both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned the second time. And their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a present for the man, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother also and arise. Go back to the man and may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your other brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. So the man took that present and Benjamin and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt. And they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of the house, Take these men to my home and slaughter an animal and make ready, for these men will dine with me at noon. Then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house, and they said, It is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we are brought in, so that we may make a case against us and seize us, to take us as slaves with our donkeys. When they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house and said, O oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food, but it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks, and there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it back in our hands, and we have brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. But he said, Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave them their donkey's feed. Then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they would eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed down before him to the earth. Then he asked them about their well-being and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they answered, Your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother, so Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out, and he restrained himself and said, Serve the bread. So they set him a place by himself and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked in astonishment at one another. Then he took servings to them from before him, but Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. So they drank and were merry with him.
everyone and welcome to Bible study. Today we are talking about Genesis chapter 44. We're kind of in the middle of the story here. So let me remind you what happened in chapter 43. Brothers came down to Egypt, and they had had a rough run-in with Joseph in Egypt. They didn't recognize Joseph when they met him after they sold him into slavery about 20 years earlier, but Joseph recognized them. He was kind of testing them to see if their character had changed at all in the past 20 years. So that's where we're picking up. In the end of chapter 43, Joseph invited his brothers into his home, and they ate together, and they had a good time. Now they're about to depart Egypt and go back to Canaan as we pick up in 44. So let's talk about our dates. When did these events happen? Joseph was sold into Egypt as a slave by his brothers when he was 17 years old. He became the ruler, or the second most powerful man in Egypt, when he was 30 years old. And then, this is at least seven years after that, because you remember, God revealed to Pharaoh that there was going to be seven years of abundance and then seven years of famine. Well, the seven years of abundance had passed, and now we're in the famine period. So this is at least 20 years after Joseph was sold into Egypt. Who are our main characters going to be in this chapter? Well, we've already met all of them. Joseph is the first one. He was the son of Jacob and Rachel, and he was the favorite son of his father. That is, until he disappeared because his brothers sold him as a slave and didn't tell their father. Joseph's 11 brothers are the next character, a group of characters in this chapter. In chapter 42, 10 of his brothers had come down to Egypt, and in chapter 43, all 11 of them came, including... Jacob, uh, including Joseph's youngest brother, Benjamin. The geography and maps for this chapter are pretty much the same as they've been for the last several chapters. Jacob and his sons lived in Canaan, and they had to go southwest to the land of Egypt, where Joseph ruled in order to buy food during the famine. Now, as we enter into our outline, I think what we're going to see here, as I mentioned, is Joseph testing the character of his brothers to see if they've changed. So our first section, verses 1 through 13, Joseph's silver cup goes missing. So after his brothers had been in his house and they had eaten together, Joseph told his servant to fill his brothers' sacks with food and to put their money back in their sacks and to send them on their way. But he told him to secretly put his own silver cup in Benjamin's sack. At first light the next day, the brothers got up, they loaded their donkeys up, and they made their way back to Cana and Luke begun their journey. But they didn't make it very far because not long after they departed, Joseph told his steward to go and to chase down his brothers and to confront him about stealing his silver cup. The steward caught up with them, he asked them why they had returned Joseph's kindness with evil and stolen his cup, and they said, we, we didn't steal his cup, and they, they denied it. And they even went so far as to say that the one who had the cup would be killed if he could find it, and it, all the others would become Joseph's servants, because they were very confident that they hadn't done it. Well, the steward proceeded to search all of their bags, started with the oldest brother, and ended with the youngest brother, Benjamin, and right when they thought that they were going to get off without any trouble, the cup was found in Benjamin's sack, and the brothers were distraught, and they tore their clothes, and they turned their donkeys around and returned back to Egypt. And then in the last 20 verses, verses 14 through 34, Judah offers himself as a substitute for Benjamin. The brothers were brought back to Joseph's house. He asked them why they had taken his things, and he told them that Benjamin was going to have to stay in Egypt as his slave. Judah, one of the oldest brothers, approached Joseph and pleaded with him. He explained their situation. He explained his father's love for Benjamin. And he told them if they he told Joseph if they returned without Benjamin, their father was going to die of heartbreak. And because it was Judah who had promised to keep Benjamin safe, Judah then offered himself as a substitute for Benjamin. Judah said, "I will stay in Egypt and be your slave if you let Benjamin return to my father." And so we have this cliffhanger situation as we end Genesis chapter 44. Now let's talk about our application and talk about Judah a little bit more, who we talked about in the application from the last chapter. If you haven't looked at that one, that one's a good place to start and then jump over to this application. In Judah, we see a shadow of what Jesus did for us. I don't think it's a coincidence that Jesus is a descendant of Judah. 
In Judah, we see a sinful man who sacrificially offered himself as a substitute for his brother. In Jesus, we see a sinless man who sacrificially offered himself as a substitute for his brother. And according to Mark chapter 3, verse 34 and 35, and Hebrews chapter 2, those who are obedient to the will of God, who follow the words of Christ, are called Christ's brothers and sisters. But Judah kind of gives us a shadow of something better that is to come, a salvation for all humanity. He gives it to us in this picture of him trying to save his brother. And this is just one of, of many shadows that we'll see of the true Savior coming down the line as Jacob's family develops into the nation of Israel and then the Savior is born from those people. All right. Okay, Judas says, 44, Joseph's cup. <coughs> Pardon me. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack, and also put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, and his grain money. So he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. When they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Get up, follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks, and with which he indeed practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. So he overtook them and spoke to them these same words. And they said to him, Why does my Lord say these words? Far be, fr far be it from us that your servants should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die, and we also will be my Lord's slaves. And he said, Now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave, and you shall be blameless. Then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground, and each opened a sack. So he searched. He began with the oldest and left off with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore the clothes, and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, and he was still there. And they fell before him on the ground, and Joseph said to them, What deed is this you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice div divination? Then Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also, with whom the cup was found. But he said, Far be it for me that I should do so. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave, as and as for you, you go up in peace to your father. Judah intercedes for Benjamin. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing, and do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age who is young. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then he said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. So it was, when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go back and buy us a little food. But we said, We cannot go down if our youngest brother is with us. Um, then we will go down, for we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me. And I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. But if you take this one from me, also from me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, 
and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father? Okay, now 45. There we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the channel. We are talking about Genesis chapter 45. The PDF outline with all this information is down in the description. It's on our website, as with a lot of other free resources. My camera battery is dying, so I better be quick today. Genesis chapter 45. Uh, when did these events take place? We know that Joseph was sold into slavery when he was 17 years old. We know that he became the second most powerful man in Egypt when he was 30 years old. Now, we know from a statement that he makes in this chapter that this happened approximately nine years later, which would place this in about 1706 B.C. As far as our characters, of course, we have Joseph, who we've been talking about for quite a while and following his life story. He was the son of Jacob and Rachel, and as I mentioned, he's a ruler in Egypt at this point. We've also got his 11 brothers. They had come down to Egypt a couple times, and they had interacted with Joseph, but they didn't know who he was. And they had had some run-ins with him, and he was trying to test their character to see if they were different men than the men that they were when they sold him as a slave 20-plus years previously. And then we've got Pharaoh. He's, of course, the, the king of Egypt. And then Jacob, he was the grandson of Abraham and the father of Joseph and his 11 brothers. Now for the all-important map, Joseph's brothers came from Canaan all the way down to Egypt to buy food during the famine. And in this chapter, Joseph is going to invite his family to move from Canaan down to Egypt, specifically to an area known as Goshen. As we go through our outline, let me remind you of what we talked about at the end of last chapter. You remember... Joseph's silver cup had been found in Benjamin's sack. And at the end of 44, Judah stood before Joseph and he said, Please let me take the place of Benjamin. Let me substitute myself. I will be your slave. Let Benjamin return home to my father because it will break his heart if he doesn't return. So now we are picking up with that conversation in our first section of 45, verses 1 through 8. Joseph is finally going to reveal his identity to his brothers. So after Joseph hears Judah's offer to substitute himself as a slave in Benjamin's place, he became emotional, and he sent every all of the Egyptians out of the room, and then he told his brothers who he was. He asked them about his father's health. Uh, his father's health was Jacob still doing well? Was he still alive? But his brothers were too stunned to, to answer him one way or another. Joseph told his brothers not to be distressed, not to be worried. He was not seeking revenge. In fact, he said that it was God who sent him to Egypt in order to save innumerable people from the famine that they were currently experiencing. Verses 9 through 15 is our next section. Joseph invites his family to come down and to live in Egypt. So there was still five years remaining in this seven-year famine. 
So Joseph said, look, don't starve up in Canaan. Come down here to Egypt and we will take care of you. So he invited his father, his brothers, and their families to come live in a place called Goshen. And then the Bible tells us that the brothers wept together and embraced and they talked. I'm sure they had quite a bit to discuss and go over for the last 20 years of their history. In verses 16 through 20, we see that Joseph's hospitality is matched by Pharaoh's hospitality. So when Pharaoh's house heard that Joseph's brothers had arrived, Pharaoh was very pleased and all the the people in his house were very pleased. And Pharaoh offered to give wagons to the elders who helped them to bring their families down to Egypt. He told them not to worry about their possessions because when they arrived in Egypt, he would give them the best of the land. And then in our final section, verses 21 through 28, Joseph's brothers returned back to Canaan with gifts and good news for their father, Jacob. Joseph gave his brothers some gifts before they left. He gave each brother a pair of new clothes. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 shekels of silver and five changes of clothing. He sent 20 donkeys laden with gifts back to his father. And when Jacob's sons arrived back in Canaan, they went up to their father and they told him that Joseph was still alive and that he had become a ruler in Egypt. Now, Jacob didn't believe them initially, but as they talked with him more, told them about their experience with Joseph, and Jacob saw the wagons that had come from Pharaoh, the text says that, quote, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. So Jacob agreed then to move his entire household down to Egypt because he wanted to see Joseph before he died. So that is Genesis chapter 45. Now let's talk about our application. God is always at work, even when it appears he might be absent. Looking back at his life, Joseph understood that God had used his brother's evil actions to bring about something good. We need to understand that just because something bad happens to our lives doesn't mean that God is no longer directing us or that he has abandoned us. Our current bad circumstances may only be the introduction to a story in which God works through us in powerful and great ways. And it's also very encouraging and relieving, at least to me, to know that God can take the sins that we've committed against people in our past, and he can turn those things for good. It's not as if if I sin against somebody or I do somebody wrong, that that messes up their story in the long run. Sure, maybe I should have been a better example. Maybe I should have been more Christ-like. But let's not be arrogant and think that we can ruin somebody else's life. Our ability to mess things up is a lot less than God's ability to patch them up and turn them for good. I know y'all hear this creakety creaky rickety old chair I sit in. <laughs> All right, Genesis 45, New King James Version. I meant to take that out, sorry. Joseph revealed to his brothers, I have got to watch this movie. It's such a good movie. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out for me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry up and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me, you and your children, your children's children. I am so watching this movie. Your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin. See that it is my mouth that speaks to you. So... You shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen. And you shall hurry and bring my father down here. 
Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them, and after that his brothers talked with him. Now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brothers have come. So it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this, load your animals and depart, go to the land of Canaan, bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you will eat the fat of the land. Now you are commanded, do this, take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives. Bring your father and come. Also, do not be concerned about your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh, and he gave them provisions for the journey. He gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. And he sent to his father these things, ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father for the journey. So he sent his brothers away, and they departed. And he said to them, See that you do not become troubled along the way. Then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob their father. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still because he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. Then Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. I know the story. I know how it goes, but it still makes me almost want to cry for him. Matthew 12, 24, 50. Actually, I know the pain of losing a son. That's why I'm kind of being emotional. Now, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. The unpardonable sin. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven man. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. A tree known by its fruit. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Fruit of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. The scribes and Pharisees asked for a sign. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, 
for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. An unclean spirit returns. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Jesus' mother and brother send for him. While he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brother stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward my, his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother, my brother and sister and mother. A lot of people say that, you know, talk bad about our Lord because of that saying right there whenever his family was outside calling for him but the reason they were there is is because of the things that he was speaking they were wanting him to like come back home and stop talking these things because they were in fear for his life they didn't believe they 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 had doubt about who he was especially his half brothers um, and that's why he said what he said but yes yeah, another step that's another lesson but anyways, I do want to thank you for uh, joining me, if you did, uh, for the Daily Bread. I'll go ahead and get this uploaded to YouTube, and then I will get the other one ready, and we'll do that one as well. So as always, thank you, uh, Jesus, uh, Father God, I mean, <laughs> ask, you add, ask that you will add a blessing to the hearing and the reading of your word tonight. And we give you praise in Jesus name and as always I love you Jesus loves you and remember there is never a pit too deep that he is not willing to pull you out amen shalom